Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the museum. Welcome to the Gordon Current Science and Technology stage, and welcome to our health fair, Brain Works. So today we have downstairs a variety of guests that have all different brain-related activities, brain imaging. You can even touch and hold an actual brain. Please feel free to pick up one of our programs and passports where you can get stamps on the back to participate with all that fun stuff downstairs. Get your own brain pencil, brain eraser, brain pen. We've got lots of brain stuff downstairs. But right now for what you're here for, we have Dr. Marissa Silveri from McLean Hospital is going to be talking to us about the teenage brain development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Silveri to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Uh, hopefully, you've been able to see some of the brain exhibits downstairs. It's really spectacular. But what I want to do for you today is I want to take you on a small journey through the adolescent brain. We've started to learn a whole lot about the brain and what it does. But you know, for everybody in the audience, we all have one thing in common. That's that we at all, all of us at one point will have been a teenager. For better or for worse, this is a period of life we think about as, you know, for some people we think it's exhilarating, it's wonderful, it's like skydiving. But we know that that's not the whole story. We also know that life as a teenager can also be really a roller coaster ride. Your emotions, you're happy one minute, you're sad the next. And I would be remiss if I, if I did not mention the influence of our peers. Nobody wants to be the odd duck out. Do I have the right genes? Do I have the right phone? Am I going to the right party? Well, you know, what we know about the brain has really been exploding, particularly in the last decade. So over the last 10 years, what this shows you is how many people are interested in studying the teenage brain. In the last decade, or the last five years alone, there have been over 7,000 publications that have come out just about the teenage brain. So why is this interesting? And what is the difference? The difference is that we now have technology, perfect for this fair today, we have technology that gives us a window into the brain. And so this window into the brain really allows us to be able to collect information that we've never really been able to do before. It provides us, so this is MRI technology, it's non-invasive. It provides a window into the brain, providing high resolution information for us. So we can look anywhere in the brain. And interestingly, what we're learning from brain imaging, we've actually really been starting to understand what we've known for a very long time, but now we can look in the living human breathing brain time after time because MRI is non-invasive. That means there's nothing harmful about having an MRI scan. The noise is not as enjoyable for some, but what we know is that we're really starting to get these fantastic pictures of the brain. So one of the things that we've known that is the most interesting is that when you're born, clearly you have a small brain that's got a lot of work to do. Interestingly, it's really in the first five years of your life that the size or the weight of your brain increases dramatically. By the time you've reached age five or six though, your brain gets no bigger for the rest of your life. And so what does that mean? If you're six years old and your brain gets no bigger, how do you get smarter? So one of the things that we know is that dur during the teenage years in particular, now every stage of life is important, don't get me wrong. Every part, we need to take care of our brains, we need to sleep, we need to eat right, we need to exercise. But it happens that during the middle, during that second 10 years of life, we know that there are very dramatic reconstruction changes occurring. And it continues into the early 20s. And it looks a little bit like this. So this is a picture of a brain cell, and you can see all the connections from brain cell to brain cell. One of the most dramatic things that happens when you're a teenager is that your neurons become better communicators. This is a process called myelination. So the connections between your neurons actually make the message go not only faster, but more efficiently. This is what we like to say as neuroscientists, this is how you get better cell service. I know. Neuroscientists tell funny jokes, I'm sure. That's only part of the story though. So if your brain gets no bigger for the rest of your life, and you're adding all this myelination, by conservation of matter, we have to also take something away. And that taking away is a process called pruning. And pruning means that we're pruning away the inefficient neurons. So luckily, we are born with billions and billions of neurons. And slowly, through time and experience and your genetics, we prune away the ones that are just not needed. 
And so as we get the ones that are not needed, now we have this lean, mean brain that's a really good communicator and can hopefully, the goal of adolescence is to become a good decision maker so you can ultimately become independent. What this looks like in a brain scan, so this is a picture of a brain as if someone were looking straight ahead at you. And what you see is that around the outside you see the gray matter, the neurons themselves. They're all interconnected by myelination. And if you look at this cartoon, you can see it a little bit better. So this is the teenage brain. You can see a whole lot of cells and not a ton of connection between them. But as you become an adult, and you don't have to be a radiologist or a neuroscientist to be able to see that these two pictures really look different. In 10 years' time, you know, if one's average lifespan is 80 to 90 years old, if we take care of ourselves, What's happening in the first two decades of life could very well turn out to be the most important brain work that's going to hopefully give you a brain that will last a really long time. When I give these talks to parents and to students and to teachers, they all want to know the million dollar question. Okay, so when is the brain adult? And what we know about that is to get from being an infant to get to being a teenager, sometimes teenagers actually look bigger, taller than adults. It's hard to tell necessarily. But what we're talking about is the changes in the brain. And we know that these changes in the brain, again, we are not the only people that study this. There are many fantastic investigators across the US, across the globe, that are really trying to understand the teenage brain and what it means for our health later. But what we do know is that we've reached neurobiological adulthood sometime in the mid-20s. Now, conventionally, people used to think that by the time you got to be 18, you graduated from high school, went off to get a job, or went to college, that your brain was done growing. We now know that that's not true. We know that into the middle of the 20s, 25, 22, you know, 20 is not 20 is not 20 for all people. So we know that the brain is still doing really important work. But we could safely start to say that our brain has reached its optimum myelination and optimal pruning sometime in the mid-20s. So how do we study this in our lab? We're particularly interested in a part of the brain called the frontal lobe. So that's the part of the brain right behind your forehead. Now don't get me wrong, all of the brain does a lot of very important work. It is an absolute myth that we only use 10% of our brains. We use all of our brain all the time. It's really a fantastic symphony that occurs to provide for us what you see to be seamless behavior. And so what we see is that a lot of the parts of the brain do a lot of really important jobs. But I highlight the frontal lobe, that part of the brain behind your forehead in orange, because this is the last part of the brain that develops. And if you look at all the functions of the frontal lobe, you see things like working memory, abstract thinking, understanding consequences, uh, being able to have what's called cognitive control. You know the right answer to something, how do you effectively hold back the wrong answer, and decision making, because that is the goal of adolescence, to reach adulthood, to make this navigation into uh, independence. And so when we do our work, we're really interested in the frontal lobe. This is an example of a task we use in our lab. So we put people in the MRI scanner and we show them these pictures. When they see a large circle, a large square, or a small circle, they press a button on a keyboard. Oh, but when they see a small square, they have to stop. This is the computerized version of Simon Says Do This. So I'd like to invite you all to participate. Now, I'm not recording your behavior, so do the best you can. And what I want you to do is this. Every time you see the large circle, the large square, or the small circle, just give your hand a small raise. When you see the small square, keep your hand down. Is everybody ready? OK. Go. Excellent job. So you came to the Museum of Science today to learn something about the brain, but no one told you that you were going to get to do a frontal lobe exercise. So congratulations. You all just stretched your frontal lobes. And what we know is if you hold up a meter to the brain and you were to measure how much energy it took for you to raise your hand when you were supposed to, compared to when you had to hold your hand down, it actually takes your brain significantly more energy to hold back a response than to give one. 
And so if you have a look into the brain, what we know, this is a comparison of the adult brain compared to a teenage brain. Now, don't get me wrong. Teens are really good at this task. They are very, very fast. However, the adults win the prize for accuracy or efficiency. So this is what we know to be the speed versus accuracy trade-off. As you get older, you slow down a little bit. And in turn, you end up being more accurate. Well, we know that if you look at teenagers from age 12 to age 13 in one year alone, how much the brain activates, actually, we can see this in imaging. We know that there are parts of the frontal lobe that actually start to fire more efficiently. And this is what underlies, you know, from the time you're, say, an eighth grader to a ninth grader, why you've gotten a little bit better about making decisions or why you've gotten a little bit better about thinking about consequences. So this is one important part of the story. It's, now it's not a surprise, it's not a secret. A lot of people know that the frontal lobe is coming online during adolescence. A lot of reason to take care of that frontal lobe. It requires a lot of energy to do its job to hold back incorrect responses, to be able to make good decisions. So what happens when you're a teenager with this increased efficiency of your frontal lobe? Well, there are a whole lot of things you gain. You, can tr you gain better control over your impulsiveness. You have improved ability to anticipate consequences. This is the whole Socratic dialogue of what would happen if. We also know that it increases your rational thought. You have optimized decision making. And you have less what we like to call what were you thinking moments. Now, granted, you know, the adults that just laughed in the audience, we have our own what were you thinking moments, but the goal here is to understand and allow our frontal lobe to develop in a way that becomes very, ineffic very efficient. Now, I talked about the frontal lobe. The rest of the brain is important, but the last part of this presentation I want to talk to you about today is another structure of the brain called the hippocampus. This is buried really in the middle of our brains, and this is the seat of our memories. Now, we know that memories are a very powerful thing. You walk into a room and you smell cookies wafting, and that makes you think of when you were 10 years old and you made cookies with your, with your grandmother. Now, here's an example of a memory that I'm sure will cue up something in your memory. So if we just give a second. This makes you feel oh so Boston, oh so Red Sox, and right now, without your even conscious effort, your memory center says, oh, where can this snow go away? When is opening day? I want to be outside. I'm in Boston. So you've just queued up your memories. Now, here is a very interesting story of a patient. His name was Clive. And Clive actually had a virus in his brain that ate away part of his memory center. This is his wife talking. And she's talking about his day-to-day -day experience. So he had a virus that ate away his hippocampus. So he has no memories for his past, except for his wife, and he can make no new memories. And what you actually see here, if you watch this clip, is he keeps a notebook. And in the notebook, he says, I am alive for the first time today. Then he comes back to it a couple seconds later and says, I didn't write that. He scratches it out. I am alive for the first time today. He will start a story, and within seconds, will say the same story over again. He can't make any new memories. Now, the idea here is that we need frontal lobes to make good decisions, but we also know that the memory center is very, very important because our frontal lobes, to be able to make a good decision, has to access our memory. And so what this picture shows you is his hippocampus that's been eaten away, and as a result, he has no memory for what he does. So how do we measure this in our lab? We measure memory in a very interesting way. So there's been a classic study that's been done in taxi drivers in London, because taxi drivers in London have a fantastic ability to navigate around a very complicated, complex, trafficy London uh, town or city. So what we know is that people have wanted to study the brains of taxi drivers. And what we see is that their hippocampus, their memory center, is actually different than people who are not taxi drivers. And why is this interesting? So we've done some work based on a very classic test of the way that people have looked at this in animals. They've created kind of like a, a London taxi driver for rodents. And what you do is you put a rodent into a pool of water and you ask the rodent to be able to find a platform. Now, rodents in water 
are not very happy. They're very highly motivated to swim around, find the platform to escape. And the way they do that is they use cues in the environment. Just the same way you will hopefully find your car after this presentation. You know where you went, you encoded all this information, hopefully you'll find your car. Every once in a while, if you're distracted when you're parking, you walk out, you thought your car was here, it's not there. That's because sometimes our brains really go on autopilot. But what we do is we want to understand if you have a healthy hippocampus, you can use the cues and you can find the platform. If you have something wrong with your hippocampus, you cannot effectively draw on your memories to be able to navigate. Now this is something we actually do while people are in the MRI scanner. We have them navigate. Now there's no swimming pool in the MRI scanner. I'm not sure how we would ever make that work. But what we do is we have them perform this on a computer. So this is a computer game. And what they have to do is they have to navigate around this environment. And while they're navigating, they're taking in the cues in the room. They're looking. Now, they can't actually see the platform here. They have learned the location based on the different pictures or the door or the window or the bookshelf. And this allows them to be able to navigate to the platform. And what you see on the left is an example of someone's path. That's someone being me. I knew where the platform was. When I started the task, I made my way there as quickly as I can. I'm drawing on what I learned around the environment, hopefully using my hippocampus to be able to make my way there. Now, you know, that's only part of the story, right? Because we want to be able to get to that. But how do you know it's because I'm not really good at using a mouse or a computer or a joystick? Well, then there's a part of the experiment where there's no cues and they can actually see the platform, and they have to make their way there. This does not require hippocampus. This just requires you looking at the environment and making your way to the platform. So what we're really interested in as neuroscientists is how we can actually test what part of the brain is lighting up. Now, this is my performance here. What we want to know is how long does it take you to get there? How efficiently can you use your memory? If you actually have a window into the brain, a lot of the brain lights up. So when you're activating your memory, it's not just your memory center. It's other parts of the brain, too. When you're, doing, when you're navigating to the visible platform, your brain also lights up. But what we're interested in is what does your brain do when it's trying to retrieve a memory compared to when it's just doing a motor task? And this is what it looks like. So the red here shows you what your brain is activating when you're retrieving a memory. And the blue shows you what your brain does when you're just mindlessly finding the platform. And if you take them apart, what you see, and this is what we hope to see, but you know, it's an interesting technological challenge to design tasks that actually elicit brain activation that we're interested in measuring. And so what you see here is the hippocampus lighting up. So we have a task, and like I said, this was used in rodents to study, you know, this has all sorts of applications. Studying people with memory deficits, studying people with Alzheimer's, studying people who general memory performance is affected. We also see, though, it's not just the hippocampus. The hippocampus, your memory center, has to work in partnership with your frontal lobe. So next time you have to make a good decision, it's not only about knowing right from wrong, it's being able to successfully access the memories that you've created. So what we know again is as developmentally speaking, now I'm telling you the cutting edge question that neuroscientists are onto now. Been there, done that about the frontal lobe. We know it's developing. The hippocampus develops really early in life. We're now interested in the connections between the two. And the more we can understand that, the more messages we can send out for people about how they can now better access their memory, how can they better anticipate, more effective learning from your mistakes, and even more optimized decision making. So, you know, just to summarize, the whole lifespan is important. We should, the call to action is really to take care of ourselves the best we can. But we know that there are very unique things about the frontal lobe and about the teenage brain that if we protect that process, we can end up having a brain that really lasts a lot longer. Because, you know, you are in a hotbed of medical innovation in Boston. We can swap out a knee, you could get a new heart valve. Neuroscientists have not been successful in finding a way to keep the brain young. So being able to find a way to protect the hippocampus, the memory center, is really our challenge in this particular decade. Um, this is a time when emotions are strong, hard to manage. A lot of what I do is look at the effects of adolescent alcohol, marijuana, and other drug use. We know that the adolescent brain is very much more vulnerable to these substances, particularly the frontal lobe and the memory center compared to adults. 
And our goal, and my uh, gratefulness to being invited here, is really that as a neuroscientist, it's my job to interpret the science for you so that the community can use it. This is my fantastic team. Neuroscience is not done in a vacuum. It takes very large groups of people to be able to pull, uh, pull all of this information together. I also have a long list of very important and amazing collaborators, both in McLean and beyond. And, and finally, quick little plug, if you would like to be in one of our research studies, we're recruiting adolescents who are 13 to 14 for a three-year study, because we don't only want to know what happens when you're 13. We want to study the same brain year after year after year. Provides a lot of information. We're also interested in college students, uh, college freshmen, and women with and without depression. So if you're interested, you could take one of my business cards. There are some handouts down below at the exhibits. And thank you so much for your attention. And I hope that you've enjoyed this little uh, journey through the teenage brain today. Thank you.